Okay, welcome back to Nuke 218, 3D modeling and animation for new compositors. And uh, we're going to really kick into some fun stuff today. So uh, we've looked at the basic fundamentals of UV projection and the like over the last couple of weeks, but now we're going to delve in to some more interesting things and specifically get into the whole concept of modeling for compositing. What we have here is a shot from Epic in 5K, and you'll uh, want to start downloading that now if you haven't already because it will take you a while. Uh, and we have a situation where this shot was lit from the side. In fact, if I bring in, you'll find in the media folder that you also have uh, a set reference. Here it is. You'll see that's where the light was directly from the side. And what we're going to attempt over the next couple of classes is the holy grail in some ways of keying, and that is to relight a subject. So very frequently you're given backgrounds and foreground elements to key together, and the lighting was different. The key light, the uh, green screen was lit from the left, the background is predominantly lit from the right. You can do things like flipping and that kind of stuff, but in certain cases it's really hard to do anything but just cry and wait for the audience to comment on how fake your shot looks and blame the poor compositor and not the on-set supervisor. Anyway, enough whining. Let's have a look. First of all, we're very lucky to be working with Epic. I actually worked on a, a couple of features recently that were shot with the Epic, and the dynamic range is just incredible for doing things like this. But let's just quickly uh, look at just doing a 2D gag relight. So I'll throw on Roto here. And we'll just come right down the middle of the face because that basically is the dividing line. Just toggle those to straight. Throw a bit of blur on our mat. Pop it up to do a lot more than that given this is 5K. And we'll throw in a grade. Ah, haven't set my project settings to the 5K format. There we go. And as you can see, there's so much juicy dynamic range in this shot that we can very easily remove that shadow. And for the most part, all of the fine skin detail and the contrast comes up very nicely. Try to do this with a JPEG sequence. You're just not going to get that kind of dynamic range out of it. But with 5K Epic Red, we have plenty of dynamic range to play with. So that's fun. That's a little uh, 2D gag. It's not really doing the job. Uh, I mean, obviously, I could go and dial this in. If I really had to, I could make a go of this. But what we really want to do is create a 3D model of the face so that the lighting actually responds to the contours of the nose, etc. And then we can effectively relight wherever we want to. At least that's the theory. And that's what we're going to test out in this class. So before we launch into this model, I want to pop back into that last bench scene just because it's a nice tight solve. And we will take a look at how to use the 3D modeling tool built into NUCAX. So here we are back at the lovely bench shot. I just opened last week's 01.chemsolved version 1 project. We already have the solve. And all I'm going to do is select the footage, hit the tab key, type in MOD, select a modeler node. Uh, and for some reason, I don't know if there's a licensing issue or what it is on my box right now. Uh, but we're waiting. And after that brief pause, here comes our modeler node. Has a source input, which is connected, of course, to the footage we just had selected. Connect the camera input to the camera for our solve. And that's all there is to it. Now, it's going to be a little cramped on this monitor, but I'm going to split my properties region and add a new viewer at the bottom. And this is typically how I always work with the modeler tool. I have one viewer set up for the 2D view and one view I'm tabbing into the 3D environment so I can see it there. There it is. You can see the camera moving around as we would expect. And I'll jump back to frame 180. There we go, we'll get our start there. The modeler node is actually very simple. And what we do is we start off by adding a face. And so I will go ahead and let's just look at doing one slat on the bench. So I'll click here, 
click here. I'm trying very hard to find identifiable points that I can reproduce at different frames. It's a little tricky with this going underneath the uh, flange of that wood, but I'll live with it and do my best. Okay, so I've got four points here to make one slat of the bench. Obviously I could have added another point and pulled it down there, but for simplicity I'll leave that alone. Now this is how uh, the model tool works. It's actually quite simple in principle. We have four points. For each of these points we know their X and Y coordinates at least on the backing plane of the camera. We know all about the camera. We know its focal length. We know its backing plane dimensions. So we can effectively reproject the X and the Y from the backing plane back through the camera frustum and calculate where their horizontal and vertical would be physically in the world. What we don't know is the depth, how far from the camera they are. So this could be a tiny ruler that is a tiny wooden ruler that's a foot from the camera or it could be the much larger slat of this bench further from the camera. And the only way to know that is by identifying how far these things are from the camera. Well, the cool thing is, if you've been following along with Mike's explanation of mathematics in his course, we know that there's such a thing as simultaneous equations. So if we can move to another frame and re-identify the location of these points, now we only need three points to define a plane, so we'll move one point into place, and this is where you want to be really careful in identifying the correct matching location, which, like I said, is a little tricky under the uh, flange there of that metal. Two points, and we'll now line up the third point. And you'll see it automatically starts to drag the fourth point because it knows that we we can define a plane once we have three points in place. And we will just leave that one right there. So what we've done is we've gone to another frame. We started at frame 180, and we set up the X and Y position of four points. We then moved to frame 100, set up new X and Y, uh, X and y positions for four points at this new frame. So we've now told Nuke what the X and Y location of each point is at two separate frames. So we can take those and basically have the Z or the Z unknown and perform a uh, simultaneous equation solve to come up with what the Z would be or the Z would be for a given point. And that's what it does. And it's actually quite a simple process and it works really well. It does suffer from the fact that we've been lazy and haven't dealt with uh, lens distortion. But like I said, you can kind of get away with it. And now we need to, uh, oh, the other things I need to mention is we can see the surface normal here, and that's where this 3D view comes in handy because we can massage the points to make sure that we get something that's nice and vertical. By the way, we haven't looked at these before, but right now we're just working in perspective view, but I can uh, switch to a right side or a left side view. I can see there's a bit of slope, and in this case, I'll choose uh, front. And I can see that pretty much that slat is nice and flat relative to the ground. If it's not, I can start moving these points around, and it will readjust the solve. And for a lot of shots, it's just not going to be as clean as this, uh, and you'll just have to fiddle around. I've done several shots where I've had to play with all these points until I get uh, what I'm looking for. and uh, But the, the cool thing is having this open allows me to have a reference and to very quickly identify whether I've correctly set things or not. All right, let's uh, jump back to frame 180. And I, I won't leave the point because we're actually going to move on to another shot. But I do want to show you that I can now add, if I mouse over an existing point that I've created for this first polygon, you'll see it kind of uh, highlights and I can click on it and add to it. So now I can say, okay, here's the next slat that comes along here, and it's right about there on the way in. It comes in here, and I want to use that 
uh, existing vertex from the other face there and then snap back to the first vertex. So I've actually only created two new vertices and I'm sharing the edges of the existing face. If I look in the vertices section there you can see sure enough I only have six vertices but I have two faces, face two, face three and I can delete faces, I can delete vertices as you can see from the button at the top there if I make mistakes. But let's go to the same frame, frame 100, where we corrected the others. And now I want to bring this vertex in line, which is a little tricky to see. Um, I think it's right about there. And because I already have three vertices lined up, uh, it automatically is moving the other one. And again, in my 3D view, I can quickly see if my surface normal is vertical to the ground or not. And it should be pretty close to vertical to the ground and I can make adjustments as need be. Okay, I'm going to pause the video for a moment because I'm going to repeat the process two more times. And I've now completed four slats of the bench, the final one sloping down a little. Let me uh, tab back to the standard perspective view and you'll see that right now apart from the interface freeze, there we go, that this edge here is a little off. It's kind of kinked up. So what I can do is I can grab the vertex for it, and I can start moving it around, and you'll see as I do, I can realign it like so and fix things up. So now I have a pretty good facsimile of the bench frame. Now, I've actually modeled entire cars like this and clean plated them straight inside a nuke. However, uh, the most common use for this is going to be, whoops, apart from moving it around, is going to be taking this in and using it as a reference inside of another application like Moto or Maya to rebuild the desk proper or actually use this as a plane to project a shadow map onto. But you'll say, see that this is a kind of a crude form of rotomation right now in that in all the frames these polygons track happily through because now they're a static part of the virtual universe we've created. All right, uh, we're going to come back to this concept in a few minutes. This was a good place to demo it on a rigid body, but what we're going to actually ultimately use it for in this next session is as a guide for our talking head. So here we are back with our talking head. I've loaded 01.class03 version 1, which you should find in your files. And as I mentioned at the very start, we want to relight this shot. So we need a 3D model of the head. Unfortunately, this is not a static photo. And the head's moving around, and it's actually quite expressive. Uh, this is Ian, by the way. So I shouldn't just talk about it. It's not just a disembodied head. It has a name, has feelings, but there you go. What we're going to do is we're going to have to track the head. Now, up until now, all we've done is tracked entire environments. How do you track a single object? Well, what we're going to do is fool Nuke into thinking that Ian's head is the world. And the way we do that is by treating it as a rigid body and actually assuming that it's not moving and that the camera is. So Nuke is going to track camera movement, even though this was a lockdown camera, Nuke is going to assume the camera is moving and Ian's head is still the entire time. And that way we can model Ian's head, place it in one location, and basically the virtual camera will do all the work for us of keeping that model aligned with all the movement that uh, Ian's doing with his head. The only problem is heads are not rigid. As you can see there's lots of expression, the forehead changes, and the jaw moves. So what we have to do is try to figure out what's going to either be the most reliable track. Now with heads, typically, I track in this area here. In fact, let me just draw it for you. I'll add a shape, and this is the region that I focus on tracking with heads for the most part. Uh, the nostrils can flare and move with uh, lip movement, especially extreme ones. And the eyebrows do move, but there is a sense in which this is the most rigid part of the face. Eyes blink too much for the most part and too expressive in movement. 
The biggest problem with a face is the jawline because the jaw is a separate rigid body that hinges over here at the cheeks. And so it can never be really considered well part of a face solve. You can certainly track it separately uh, and that comes in handy. But for the most part, if you're trying to find a rigid body, you'll use the top part of the head. Now, normally I just pop in a Mocha Pro and do this, but with Nuke X there is a built-in planar tracker. Uh, I still prefer Mocha's to be honest just because it's amazing and it's so easy to copy and paste between Mocha Pro and Nuke. Uh, but we've got Nuke X here. It has a planar tracker so it's just as easy on this one to use that. So I'm going to hit the tab key, type in PLA, select the planar tracker. It adds two nodes if you're not used to this. And I'm going to pop down just to save time. This is a 5k plate. I'm going to drop down to half res. Uh, for this solve because I don't really need accuracy. What I'm doing is building a garbage mat that we're going to use for the tracker. So let's go ahead and I'm going to create first of all something for the planar tracker to do. Like so. And that should do it for me and I'll just go ahead and track forward. Planar track complete and we should actually just be able to use this shape rather than uh, drive another shape with the corner pin because this does pretty well track with the features we're after. Okay, let's go ahead and add a camera tracker. Before I do, let's make sure we pop back up to full resolution. We want all that 5K goodness working for us. And we'll add a camera tracker. And if you're like me, you always forget whether you should put the mask to source alpha or source inverted alpha. In this case, it is source inverted alpha. But if you get it wrong, go to tracking. I'll set the features up to 600. Nice, juicy. And uh, we'll set preview features. See the points are clearly in the wrong place. So we'll just pop back to camera tracker and set that to source inverted alpha. All right, now we want to uh, get a, a good selection of points. I'm most concerned about that hair detail because that's, uh, apart from blowing in the breeze, uh, that hair looks like it's in a pretty locked position for the most part. So we're going to go to tracking and see what happens when we adjust the detection threshold. If I bring it down, it seems to uh, spread out a lot more and that's good that's what I want if I bring it up the other end we're going to cluster and we want uh, given that there's so much moving in the shot we want a good representation so I'm going to bring detection threshold low uh, I can also adjust the feature separation to force features to cover the image uh, so I could set this to 32 and, or I could set it to 1 you'll see the difference there I'm going to leave it at 12 because often when you force it to separate too far, it's actually finding fairly tenuous links. Actually, maybe I'll drop it down to 10. There we go. Uh, we'll leave it there. Minimum length of track. I'm going to set this up to 6 because most of these tracks, especially when the forehead is creasing and moving around and expressing itself, you don't want to use those things because they're no longer representative of the rigid body that is the head because the creases are moving. So we want to be able to quickly discount fast movements like that. And so a minimum length of six will make sure that we don't track anything that's fairly transient in its, in its nature, that's not staying with the pack for a decent amount of time. Uh, that's all I'll set. And uh, we're going to go ahead and run the track. I'll Stick it back to frame zero. It actually doesn't really matter. I'm going to version up and click track features. Track's complete. I just clicked solve camera. Let's see how we do. Over in the refine tab, we have a solve error of 8.48. But don't panic. We're not done yet. There are obviously a lot of points uh, that were moving that really didn't make sense because of the transigent nature of the forehead features. So let's go ahead and dramatically drop these errors. So we'll set this uh, down to, uh, well, let's increase the minimum length to 8. We'll set the 
max error to four, the to uh, the max track error, and that's across its lifetime, and the maximum the track can ever be out will set to 12, and recalculate the solve. And we're down now to a solve error of 2.78, and quite frankly, I'm going to be happy with that given what we're tracking. You'll see how many of the points now are rejected in red, and we're only using a few of the points that are more reliable, which is fine by me, and that should give us a good solution for what we're going to do. Remember, we're working at 5K here, so if we're effectively going to output around 2K, we can halve at least the solve error, and we're really looking at something around uh, under 1.5 pixel reprojection, which is actually pretty decent for what we're trying to do here. So let's create a scene and see how we did. How do we test this out? Well, let me blow away all these things. A good way to test it out is to use our friend the modeler tool. This will not only serve as a test to make sure that we got things accurate, but will also allow us then to have uh, a baseline geometry to bring in to Modo to help us with our modeling tasks. So let's go ahead and add a modeler node. If uh, for some reason things went wrong for you, I've actually just stopped and saved this as o2.class03 scene solved. So you can go ahead and load that one up if you need to. Something went awry with yours to continue on. And I've just grouped these things up. Uh, just to be clear, if you're not familiar with the term, rigid body refers to something that has no moving parts. So the idea is this head, we want something that doesn't have moving parts, that the jaw is not connected. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, there's our camera tracker, and here's our solve scene. We've just added the modeler, and before we go ahead and use it, let's actually define some kind of axis coordinates uh, just to be helpful. So we'll double click the camera tracker, bring up its points, and we want something central for our origin, and the tip of the nose is probably as good as we're going to get. This is a 71 track uh, point with a decent error, maximum of 5 pixels, which in this case at 5k is not too bad. So select that right click and say ground plane set as origin. And we'll keep that selected and move up, 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 up. And that's 19. How's that for... This is fairly central in the universe. So we will shift click this. Make sure our other point is still highlighted yellow and it is. And we'll right click and choose ground plane set Y. So we now have an origin set, a Y set, and the only thing left we need is something to set X. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot to play with in that regard. Uh, I've got some hair over here. Uh, no real matches. Let's go from here. 19, 21, 10. I'll just go with this 21 here. But I come across and try to find something that should essentially be its counterpart. Let's just crop the screen. I'll go with this point here. And we'll just right click ground plane set X. Now we're just doing the best we can here to try and make some sense of the scene if I tab in. And look now. The nose should be at the origin. So we'll tab back to the main view. And uh, let's close this out. In theory, we have everything set up. So let's, this model we added a moment ago, I'm going to connect its source to our source footage, its camera to the camera. What we need to do is find the frame that's the most dramatically different from the initial frame we're going to use in our modeler. So we use frame zero. We need to find somewhere where the camera moves most dramatically in contrast to where it was at frame zero to help us get the most parallax for the solve. Double click the camera, make sure it's the only thing loaded in properties, tab in so we can just see the camera at play, and let's watch through the footage. You'll see right around here is where it gets nice and high, at least compared to the original position. Let's go for frame 160 as our second frame. So we'll start at zero, 
tab in, and let's work on the nose. You'll see we have a typical crease uh, that you'll usually find on someone's nose right about here. That will help us define a center point. And we'll cry, try and create a triangle out of the nose, so we'll use the extremities where the nose gets widest at the left and right. So we have a modeler node, double click it to load its properties up. Oops, I must have accidentally done something with this already. Let's do that again. My apologies. Uh, if that's saved out in the file, you'll need to correct it. Let's hook that up again. All right. So we've got a modeler node, and we're at frame zero. Let's begin by selecting an add face right down the center of the nose at that crack, point one. Let's try and find this extremity here in line with the center of the bottom of the nose, point two, point three. Back in. Now I said 160. Make sure I'm happy with all those. Those look pretty good. Go to frame 160. And now we'll realign. So there's the crease. By the way, I don't know if you've seen this, but you'll notice there are two separate points labeled vertex 1. One is the point you're moving to, and the other is the closest position that you could solve that particular point to uh, stay consistent. In fact, we need to put that there, which doesn't make sense yet because I haven't aligned the other two points, but once I do, uh, it will. So now, I shall move this in line. And the final point will create a try. And how do we know if that worked? Well, let's step to, say, frame 100, and we'll see that we're getting a pretty good track with the location of the nose. It may not be perfect, but it should be enough to give us a guide to position our model when it comes to that time. All right. Um, let's see if we can do any more good. Always good to use the same points when you're adding to these. So I'm going to version up, and now let's see how we go if we add to this. So if we want to make another poly coming down here, we'll select, click on the corner of the eye, back to this one, back to there, go to frame 160. And relocate vertex 4. And under the corner of the eye again. And I need a new viewer over here. I'll tab it in. 3D. I can see I've got something that's actually a little too coplanar for what I'm looking for. So let me adjust this point and see what I can do. We need to be back a little bit. There we go. Let's go back to frame zero and do the other side. And just for giggles, let's see if we can get an eye shape done. So I will go ahead, come up to the center of the iris, fold, extremity of the eye. You know what? Let's use the whites. Be a little easy to gauge. And 
at the face here. I'm just trying to find features that are going to be easy to identify at the other end. This guy, vertex 8. See, now I have a rather disturbing looking eye in 3D. So I need to move this point. To make more sense of it. And we'll do the other eye very quickly. Back to frame zero. Okay, as you can see, this model is by no means perfect, but it does give us a general sense that the geometry is all lining up in the same place. And this is going to help us, even though it looks pretty disturbing at this point, this will allow us to use this as a reference to setting up our uh, initial model position that we can then massage into place from there. We now have some basic geo that we can take into Moto. Question is, how do we get it out of Nuke and into Moto? All right, let's take a look at how we do that. First thing we'll do is, with our modeler node selected, we'll just add it to our scene. And after the scene, we'll add a right geo node. I want to connect this right geo to the scene so I can get everything I want, the point cloud, the camera data, and the modeler node all connected in at once. So in the right geo, I need to track down a location to store it, and I'll put this in uh, our class 3 project folder. I've got a geo section, and I will call this uh, Ian Head Guide um, Geo V001.fbx. And as soon as I put the FBX on there, don't ask me why I have to click the open button. Uh, FBX options come up and it automatically is selecting to bring in geometries, camera, lights, axes, and point clouds. And that's a good thing. And all we have to do is go down to the X, or oh, click the execute button here, make sure the frame range is set correctly, click OK, and away it goes rendering out our FBX scene. If you're not familiar with FBX, it's a standard interchange file format. It's called FBX because of Filmbox, which was the original company uh, that made Motion Builder before it was acquired or changed its name to Kydera. And then Kydera was acquired by Discrete, I think, and then Discrete was acquired by Autodesk. And uh, Autodesk adopted it as its default standard to switch between different applications. Uh, one of the biggest problems you're going to get with FBX going between Nuke and Maya and other applications is if you have version mismatch. And this happens all the time. So I just want to warn you about that. Make sure that uh, the applications you're using have the same FBX date. So if they're using version 2012 of the translator, make sure they're all using the same version of the translator. There's a utility you can download from Autodesk that will actually convert between different years uh, to make the formats compatible because FBX has changed over the years and so the actual coordinate system can be completely off if you try to translate from one to the other. So be warned when you're doing a, a transfer back and forth between you and other applications, make sure that their FBX uh, versions are matching. Right then, go ahead and launch Moto. Got to love an application that launches that fast in this day and age. That says something about Codebase. Uh, file open. We don't import, we just open the FBX. And I just discovered there's something weird in Moto. It actually thinks this folder is a geo uh, 
item. So I actually had to put an underscore in the 03 underscore geo. So you'll have to correct that if you have any problems. And there's our FBX. I will open it up. And go to the items tab over here on the right hand side. And you can see here's my scene. You'll have to get used to uh, the navigation controls. In this case, it's option to pivot around. Option command held down together. Or I should say alt. Sorry, I'm being very Mac centric here. The alt or option key will pivot around. The option and control, uh, the alt or con and control or option command will actually give you a pivot rotate like that. Option shift will allow you to move around. And uh, you can zoom in and zoom out with a scroll wheel or the greater than or less than keys. Uh, we'll get into more of this in a moment, but I just wanted to show you that sure enough, we have all of our point cloud coming in and our quick knockup of the nose and eyes. And notice their position right about uh, where they would theoretically appear based on our modeler node, but that may not be when you look at the point cloud exactly accurate. That may need to come forward a little bit. doesn't really matter because we're really more focused about knowing where everything should sit and they'll be useful when we come back to that later. However, I'm going to leave you in a little bit of suspense there because we will continue to model the face next week, but I do need to get some basics into you about how to use Modo, especially since for the most part this is the first time any of you have ever opened it up. So, uh, Let's just go to File and choose Close All. And I'll take you for a quick tour of the interface. The interface is actually laid out very nicely. You have tabs along the top for different tasks. So if you're just modeling, you have Model and Model Quad. I'll explain the difference in a moment. You have a section for painting, for topographical, uh, uh, sorry, uh, topological work which basically means taking a really complex mesh and rebuilding a simpler mesh on top, which is actually another very useful compositing based task. Uh, a tab for working with UVs, a tab for working and laying out your scene when you have multiple objects, and uh, Modo ships with a bunch of different pre-built elements that we can leverage uh, for certain tasks. You have a setup section for animation uh, for character animation typically, an animate tab which is where you can actually work on the keyframing, and then a render tab where you can see what's going on with your scene. And down the right hand side we have another section for all of the properties. This is just like the properties in Nuke. You have a properties tab which gives you all the different sliders you can twirl. Uh, the other most important one you'll find here is the list tab which gives you a list of any UV maps that are present, weight maps, and also allows you to select things by polygon edges and vertices. And we'll look at that a little bit later. The display and channels tab, probably for what we're doing, we, we won't even visit them, but they're there. Up the top, you have items, which is a list of all the stuff in your scene. You have the shader tab, which gives you access to how this thing renders out, along with any shaders which are basically the material, the texturing that goes on top of objects. They'll all be listed here and accessible here. And uh, you have another section called groups for creating groups. Images for importing any image maps like UV texture maps and the like that you bring in here. And a QuickTime tab. And I have no idea what this is for because I never used it, but it looks like it's got a bunch of QuickTime tutorial videos that you can access. So there you go. Uh, most of the time we'll be working with the items tab and the shader tab here and the properties and the lists here. Uh, as you'll see things are very easily laid out. So you, even though it's a very complex app these days, has lots of functionality, there really aren't too many places to visit when you're first learning it. So let's talk about the modeling tab. We can select uh, in the model tab any of these primitive shapes. And uh, let's go ahead and use a cube. I can select the cube tool and then just drag out a cube. And if I use my option key to pivot around, you see I can grab 
little square in the middle and pull out and I now have myself a cube. To complete this, you drop the tool. You do that by hitting the space bar and that will finish the creation of the tool. And now we have ourselves a uh, rectangle, not quite a cube. Uh, in Modo, there are two tabs here called Model and Model Quad. And I'm going to be very quick. There is a Modo Introduction to Modo course that you could be taking, an FX PhD, so I won't kill things, but I will teach you the basics that you need to know to get around. Uh, again, all the things we're going to be doing in Modo, you could be doing somewhere else like Maya uh, if you know the tool set there. It's not really that much different. Okay, so uh, why do we have a model and a model quad? Well, model quad gives you the typical four views where we have a perspective view over here. Uh, we have a top-down view, a front view, and a side view. And we can change these views anytime we like by choosing a different one. So, for example, instead of top, if I want bottom, I can choose that. On this particular model, they'll look identical. And we can also change the way things are displayed. So right now, this is displayed as an advanced OpenGL. I could choose to display it as a wireframe. I could choose to display it as a solid. Uh, or one of the really cool ones is Gooch Tone Shading, which actually helps you identify uh, the details of your object a lot easier when you have a lot going on. But we'll just switch that back to Advanced OpenGL. There's also a reflection here if you want to simulate a reflection and see what your object will do when it's rotating around. Let's pop that back to Advanced OpenGL. Okay, so we understand these two buttons. This one selects what the view will be. This one selects how the view is displayed. And uh, there is the ability also to create uh, final render quality uh, views inside of these, like you can see over here in this render tab, but we will get to that later in the course. So that's Model Quad. The model actually gives you a single viewport, and the idea behind this is you have something called the work plane, and you'll see it here, this uh, light colored grid that you're seeing in the shot, and it aligns to whichever axis is most appropriate based on how you're working. So right now it's aligned to the YZ axis. You can see down here we have a little compass telling us where we are and that the work plane is currently in the YZ axis. As I rotate around, it snaps to the uh, YX axis. So now it's working on the X and the Y coordinates. So functions that you need to do by an axis can automatically be done just by reorienting your view here. So the idea is instead of having to work with three different views and a perspective view here, top, front, and right, you can just work with one viewer and depending on how you orient your workspace will change the way things are picked up. My recommendation is if you're starting out in 3D, you stick to the model quad and that's what I'll be doing for this course just because it's a little easier to see what's going on. Uh, but a lot of people swear by the uh, work plane in Modo, and a lot of artists just work there, so you're welcome to get to know that. A couple of last points here just to get oriented, and uh, that is up the top here we have vertices, edges, and polygons, and this is very important. If you're in vertice mode and you select, drag through, you're actually selecting points or vertices on your model. So I could select these four points and hit the W key to bring up the move tool. You'll see these are the tools over here, but you'll want to learn the hotkeys for them. Y, W, E, and R, uh, which actually is W on the keyboard, the QWERTY keyboard. E is the next one for rotate. R is the next one for scale. And uh, Y is an alternate scale. So W, E, R are the most important ones. W for move. You'll see I'm moving just those two points because that's all I had selected. E is for E rotate. Don't ask me how that works. It doesn't. And R is for scale. And uh, scale will do nothing on the vertical axis because there's nothing to scale. All these points are in the same position uh, in X. So that won't change anything. But I can scale in and out sideways or vertically. And I'll undo that. W-E-R. To drop the tool, just press it again and it will uh, 
go back to unselected and to drop a selection click in the gray space away from the object so if I select points click to deselect edges will select an edge of your model and the edges are very important you'll see once we start getting into subdivision surface modeling and so I can select one edge I can select another edge I can select a third edge by holding down the shift key as I select or I can drag select through multiple points at once I can also do a marquee select by right holding down the right mouse button and rotating around there's a really cool feature in Modo though to grab a whole ring which is very common when you're doing subdivision surface modeling as we'll see and that's to double click an edge when you do that it will select an entire uh, section an entire ring it may not be the one you want so the other thing you can do is click shift click and uh, you can either double click or you can click one shift click another and then hit the up arrow and it will try to find the most logical next step now sometimes it gets it wrong and you can hit the down arrow to undo and I can just go through and finish selecting this let's have a look at this edge I'll use that and then I'll use this with the shift key and now I can use the up arrow and it will continue my selection through so a bunch of really cool ways to work with selections and uh, polygons will select the entire face so I can select that face shift click to select another face I can uh, control click to deselect a face like so so let's just recap W E R W for the move tool E for the rotate R for the scale tool if I grab the center here by the way I can scale uh, Oh, actually, I'm not grabbing the center. Sorry, I'm mixing my apps. If I grab these little circles here, I can scale in one entire plane at once. All right. Uh, so W E R to drop a tool, you just press that tool again, and will deselect. Once you've selected an object, click uh, whether it be a vertice, an edge, or a, or a polygon, a face. You can click away to deselect. You can shift click and control click to deselect. All the pretty typical selection methods. Uh, finally, vertices, edges, polygons, you also have an items mode and that will allow you to select entire items. Now there's only one item in our scene, it's this cube we created, so selecting in items mode will select the entire object and you'll see everything moves together, whereas if I'm in polygon mode and I select just a face, press the W key to move, it will just move that face, that polygon. Okay. Uh, one last thing that comes in handy if you're selecting say in polygon mode you select this polygon but really you just want to select the points holding down the alt key or the option key allows you to convert your selection so I could convert from selecting this entire face to actually selecting the vertices that make up the face so I option a option or alt click on vertices and now I have a selection of that face's vertices by the way, if you hit Command Z to undo, it will actually remember the last selection, which doesn't happen in a lot of other apps, and it's really nice in Modo that it actually counts selection as a step. So if you go to the trouble of selecting all kinds of points and then make a mistake and deselect them, just undo and it will bring your selection back. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the other m really critical thing to learn here, this is a crash course, I know, but you can rewind and play, is Spacebar. I'm in vertices mode, which selects vertices, hit the spacebar, it'll toggle to edges, spacebar again, toggle to polygon, and it will remember your last selection. So if I'm in vertices mode, and I have, I'm right dragging right now, I have those points selected. If I then toggle to edges mode, it has no selection currently, but let me make a selection. Polygon mode, it has uh, this face selected, and I toggle through, even if I control drag to deselect that point, it hasn't changed the edges and polygon selection when it being back to vertices it remembers my last selection there okay so that's the spacebar we'll toggle through those three most important modes vertices edges polygons uh, last thing when you're getting to know the tool set you'll see you have your basic tools here which are for creation and moving things around you have a deform set for jacking stuff up deforming it and you have a duplicate for making duplicates of things, which is to bridge, to mirror something across an axis, all kinds of stuff. Mesh edit, which is stuff that we'll be uh, using for subdivision surface modeling. 
Vertex is stuff that's specifically used to set up points. So for example, if I go ahead and move these points into a horrible configuration, I can actually, in this, whoops, I gotta drop the tool first. I can right drag to select those points. And in the vertex tab, there's something called set position. So I could set the X position of all of these back to say um, five meters. That was a little too far, but you'll see, well, let me undo that because I'm actually in millimeter increments. So let's just say I line them up with 10 millimeters. By the way, I can see the down here at the lower left is where it will tell me uh, the current positions of my mouse. So right now this is around 10 millimeters. So I'll say uh, set position and X 10 mm for millimeters. Okay, bang. And now those points have all been locked, at least in the X, to the same position at 10 millimeters away. All right, uh, and we have tools relevant to the edge selection, to the polygons, and to UV work. Uh, I'll be introducing those as we need to. One other really handy tool just to get to know is the, the uh, drag tool, Control T, as opposed to the W key, uh, which will just move stuff. Control T is the drag tool. And what that does is allows you on the fly without having to click anything else to just click on points or polys or edges in your shot and move them without having to pick up and drop tools. So control T gets you in this mode where you can just select something and move it without having to think, which is actually really nice. All right, uh, that should have done enough damage for this week. However, I can't leave without showing you the basics of what we're going to be doing, which is called subdivision surface modeling. Now, a lot of people think subdivision surface modeling is a strange place to get started with modeling. They usually teach you the basics of playing with spheres and cubes and things first off. Uh, but actually, subdivision surface modeling is quite simple, quite intuitive. And for what we want to do as compositors, probably the most useful tool that we could have access to. So I'm going to clear this scene. Just go to File, uh, Close All, don't save, and you'll see if I press down the Shift key, a plus appears under all these primitives here. And what that does, it will already cre uh, automatically create a unit primitive for you. So I'm going to hold down the Shift, click the cube, and that will automatically create a cube element. You'll see there's a grayed out mesh layer, that was the default layer. Grayed out means there's no actual geometry in it, but it automatically created another layer called cube another object in our scene, and here it is. I'm going to turn on symmetry. It's right here. I'll set it to X. And what that means is that anything I do to one side of my model, I'm going to control T to get that drag tool, it will automatically do to the other side, which is actually really handy. I'll just undo that. And next thing I'm going to do is press the tab key. And what that does is subdivides the surface. What does subdivision mean? Well, subdivision means, and you can actually do this manually by pressing Shift D. I, I wouldn't recommend this because this bakes it into your model, but it will actually create a new polygons, kind of like philography. Have you ever seen that? A bunch of straight lines creating a curve if they're all uh, moved uh, at an angle. But if I do subdivide here, it subdivides this object once. I'll do it again. And the more we subdivide, the smoother it gets until finally it's a nice round ball. And that's ultimately what the computer is doing with our mesh when we hit the tab key. Uh, except it's not baking it in. Our geometry is always stored like this. But when we hit the tab key, we're seeing the computer subdividing it into a bunch of uh, smaller polygons that create a curve. And this is what is called a subdivision surface. So I'm going to move to polygon mode. I'm going to select this polygon. I'm going to press B for bevel. Click on the polygon to activate the tool. And what I've done is I've made an additional polygon. And I can then use this tool here to move it and scale it. And then I can actually use the regular tools W, E, and R if I wanted to rotate it or scale it some more. So W, for example, I can move it. Notice, by the way, that 
uh, for convenience, you can actually click to move the XYZ movers of the controller on screen display. Uh, it's still going to move it from the same selection point, but it allows me to adjust this wherever I want. Uh, so if it's a, sometimes a little hard to see what's going on when the tool's here, so I can click down here and still use the handles wherever I want to. Uh, I'm going to hit the spacebar to drop the tool, and then spacebar again to drop the selection. And I'll go back to Polygon, somehow I got out of there. And I'll click in here uh, to select these. Notice because we're in symmetry mode, which is most useful for faces and bodies, it selects both uh, the polygon I clicked on and the one that corresponds it to it on the other side of the x-axis. I'll press the B key again to bevel, click again, and now I'll see, you'll see I have an additional shape. I can drop the tool, press B again, a uh, spacebar to drop the tool, press B again, it's like bevel, click to activate, drag out, spacebar to drop the tool, B to press, uh, to activate bevel again, click again, and now you can see I'm expanding this to create my final shape. And uh, that's all I'm going to leave you with this week, just so you've got something to play with. You can select these things. You can then go into edge mode and see what happens if you double click an edge to select the whole edge and move it around. And uh, start playing because this is the basics of subdivision surface modeling. Love to see you in the forums to tell me what you're struggling with because this was such a whirlwind tour of Moto, but I wanted to get us up and running. If there are any gaps in the knowledge and you're finding you just can't get something done, let me know. But just play around with this beveling and uh, moving things around. And we will continue with this next week and build out our face model.